John, I've been working in ALS for the past 16 years, seen now more than 2,000 patients with it. And I can honestly say the past year has been the most exciting one I've ever seen. I think in large part because of the ice bucket challenge and all the new resources that came around about two years ago, we're now starting to see some of the fruition of all those new resources. So I'll tell you about three sort of categories of breakthroughs in the past year. The first is in understanding what causes ALS. You know, if we're ever going to fix ALS, we probably need to know what causes it in the first place. So there's two types of ALS, which are divided by what caused them. One type is called familial ALS. That's the type of ALS that's caused by a bad gene that a person is born with. And in the past year, we've discovered a lot of new genes, including one that we discovered over at Duke called TBK1. So what we, was that that you found that? Uh, we found this, uh, this gene, I think it was about, uh, about a year ago. Yeah. yeah was published in the, the journal Science. Those are your researchers? Yeah, that's a, it's a group of people that I work with. I'm part of a big group of people that, yeah. was, that was part of that. So we now know of more than 60 different genes that a person can be b born with that can cause ALS. And together, those explain about 15% of all the cases of ALS that we see, which doesn't sound like much, but when I started, we could only explain about 2% of all ALS. So we're making progress. Now, sporadic ALS, which is the kind that most people have, 85% of people, there's no obvious broken gene in those people. But there was a paper published about six months ago that could turn out to be the biggest breakthrough in the history of ALS. So they looked at 10 people with sporadic ALS, and they were looking for something called an endogenous retrovirus. So let me give you a little bit of background to understand that. We've known now for about 20 years that the retrovirus HIV a virus that comes from outside of us, can cause a picture that looks just like ALS. And yet when you treat those patients who have both HIV and this ALS-like disease, with medicine for HIV, the ALS-like disease goes away. So for 20 years, people have been looking for another retrovirus that we could be missing in people who come in looking like they have ALS, and no one's found it. But that's because people have been looking for retroviruses that come from outside of us it turns out there's retroviruses inside of us that are part of our DNA. They're called endogenous retroviruses. So when our ancestors were exposed to retroviruses, they either died or they made those retroviruses part of their own DNA. And people have referred to that DNA as junk DNA. We used to think it didn't do anything. But this guy at Hopkins said, I wonder if it could be that one of these retroviruses is becoming reactivated. And in every patient that he looked at with sporadic ALS, there was evidence of one particular endogenous retrovirus becoming reactivated. It's called HERVK, HERVK. And in nobody that he tested without ALS was that retrovirus reactivated. And even more amazingly, he took that retrovirus and he gave it to animals and they got an ALS-like disease. So this could turn out to be huge, and there's a follow-up study underway, including a trial to treat people with an HIV cocktail and see if we can make their ALS go away. That's amazing. Yeah. That's within the last six months? Just within the past six months. What percentage, so you said, what percentage was familial? How much is familial? 15% of ALS yeah, is caused by a bad thing. gene, and 85%, we can't find a genetic cause. So if this guy's onto something, it would apply to the 85%, the big group of people. Correct. These were, these were all people without a family history of ALS that he tested. Well, that's just amazing, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It's incredible. Uh, like I say, it could turn out to be the biggest paper in the history of ALS, if we can replicate it and show that we can actually treat these folks and make them better. And what would that mean for this disease? Well, it could be a cure. It could be a cure for ALS. So... Again, it's too early to tell. It's just one paper, but it's incredibly exciting. And for a guy in your shoes who's been doing this so many years, yeah. what does this mean to you? Well, it'd be the greatest day of my life if I woke up and read in the newspaper that the cure for ALS had been found. I've seen way too many great people you know, taken down by this disease. I'm ready to see it end. You mentioned that there were three things that you wanted to mention and talk yeah. about. That was the first one? That was the first one, okay. understanding the causes of ALS. Right. The second one is improvements in care. So we can now offer people with ALS more options for living with the disease than we ever could before. And that's especially true of veterans who get ALS. So having worked on both sides of the streets and having you know, visited a lot of other ALS clinics around the world, I can honestly tell you that veterans with ALS have better 
options than any other group of people with ALS anywhere in the world. Is that because of the coverage, the benefits yeah. coverage, what, yeah. essentially what they can afford because of the U U.S. government? Yeah, so, right? so they get service connected for the disease. And as a result of that, you know, they get free doctor's visits, they get free medication, they get free equipment, they get home care. Um, there's research going on at the VA that's not going on anywhere else, including a study that I'm part of where we're testing something called a brain-computer interface. Have you ever heard of that before? Not me. Yeah, so one of, the, one of the most frustrating things for people with ALS is their loss of ability to communicate. So uh, most people are still in there, but as they lose connection with their muscles, they can't talk anymore. Well, then we can get them to type, but sooner or later they can't type anymore. Well, then we can get them to communicate with their eyes. Well, in some people, even that's lost, eye movement. So how do you communicate with somebody who can't move anything? We've got this cap now that we, we've invented here at the VA that you can put on a person's head. It's got wires coming off of it, and we can actually tap into the brain's electrical activity and train people to use that electrical activity to move a cursor, to spell, to surf the internet, to send emails, even to shop online. So it's an incredible piece of technology that we're just starting to develop, but the study was done here at the VA. That's exciting. Very exciting. So, so living with the disease would be a, a, the, the second thing, you, the, the advancements in, in care. Exactly. In with the exactly. Disease. What was the third thing? So the third thing is our trial pipeline. So while I'm really proud of where we are today, the future looks really exciting. <clears throat> We've got some things in our trial pipeline, you know, new, new treatments that we're testing that do things that we could never do before. So there's a drug called Tiraceptive. Tiraceptive. It's invented by a company called Cytokinetics. It's the only drug that's in a phase three study right now, you know, the really big expensive study to really see if it works. All the things leading up to this, all the small preliminary trials, all showed a benefit that people who were on this drug held on to the strength in their arms, legs, and breathing muscles longer than people on placebo. Hmm. So that's something we could never do with any drug is preserve strength. Even more exciting, there's a drug out there called Copper STM. So this is a drug that we've given to our animal model of ALS. And for the first time in history, the progression of disease in that animal model stopped and they had a normal lifespan. And most of the drugs that we've ever tested in that animal prolong survival by a few days or a week. This, this gave the animal a normal lifespan. So we can't wait to get this out into human trials. And then finally, right over at Duke, I'm doing a study of a nutritional supplement, which is called Lunacin which is one of the very few things I've ever seen associated with an ALS reversal. Did you know there were people who get ALS who actually get better from it? Most people don't know that. It's a very, very small percentage. I found 24 people like this in my career who really do appear to have ALS from my review of their records and really do appear to have gotten better. And sometimes those improvements are associated with a treatment. In this case, a nutritional supplement called Lunacin, which we're now taking into a small study of 50 other patients to see if we can make anyone else get better. So it sounds like, if I could put a bow on this, it sounds like if there's no, never a good time to have ALS. If you're going to have had ALS, this is the time where it's most exciting and your prospects are looking the best because one, uh, the treatment is better. Two, the, uh, the, the lifestyle is better, even wherever you are, whatever stage of the process you're in. And there's prospects for an actual cure. Absolutely. Do I have that right? Absolutely. Now, I mean, in, in the 16 years that I've been involved in this, I've never seen a more exciting year. You know, I mean, we've, we've, we've got a better understanding of why people get ALS than we ever have had before. People with ALS, especially veterans, are living longer and better lives than they ever have before. And the trial pipeline is more exciting than ever, including things that could potentially be a way to stop or reverse ALS in the next few years. I know you're busy. I want to talk before you, we let you go about public awareness. You mentioned the ice bucket challenge. Obviously, Larry Stogner for us has been the thing that has really galvanized our audience and our station interest around this particular disease. Talk about public awareness and how important it is to have a public face. Maybe it's Larry Stogner or maybe it's any number of other heroes. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, but, but, but talk about that a little bit. Okay. Well, you know, ALS is not a very common disease. The best available data that we have suggests there's only about 12,000 people in the United States living with this disease. So I think it's best summed up by a person named Margaret Mead. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can work together to make a difference. In fact, that's the only thing that ever does. So we've got a very small group but they're very talented, they're very passionate, they're very committed to this cause, and 
they're doing amazing things. I mean, the ice bucket challenge, every other disease in the world is looking at ALS and saying, how did that happen? We've never seen anything like that, that exploded awareness and exploded funding. And we're starting to see the benefits of that now with all this research I talked to you about. Yeah, um, is there any way to, is there, is there anything we should be doing as far as uh, looking at numbers, as far as, uh, you mentioned 12,000, that's a good number, just to help us kind of get some of the meat and potatoes of the story together, is there, are there other numbers that stick in your head that are interesting for our audience to think about? You know, I think, I think that's probably the, the most important number is that there's not that many people that have the disease. Um, other numbers to think about, so when you look at the prevalence of ALS, which is what that number is, it sounds pretty rare, but when you look at the lifetime risk of the disease, it's about one in 700. Well, how can that be? Those numbers don't seem like they would go together. Because it's, you take the average uh, incidence by age and you add it up over a lifespan of 70 years oh. and you come out with a lifetime risk of one in 700. So this is why most people know someone that has ALS. Unfortunately, because people with ALS don't typically last very long, that's why there's not a lot of people living with the disease. You know, the commonness of the disease in terms of how many new cases a year, it's the same as MS, which has a lot more attention. But MS is not usually a fatal disease. People with MS live often a normal lifespan. ALS, last night we talked to a, uh, a vet with ALS uh, who had a ventilator in, and... His wife left me with the impression that they would be able to basically, if they wanted to, on the ventilator, live a full lifespan. Is that the case? I, I, was, I always understood ALS to be a fatal disease, but that was not the impression I was left with yesterday. It was, it was dis discordant from my understanding of what ALS is all about. Well, it's a difficult decision, and the great majority of people with ALS choose not to be attached to a ventilator. For the, for the great majority of people, their life does end prematurely. Um, for folks who are attached to a ventilator, on average, they live an extra two years, but there's wide variation in this disease, right? So ALS can take you down whether you're on a ventilator or not. It can, yeah. Oftentimes, people on a ventilator don't die from ALS. They die from a complication of not being able to move and to, you know, to have this tube in them. So, I mean, even with the absolute best of care, I mean, think about Christopher Reeve, Superman. You know, I mean, he was an incredibly popular guy, wealthy guy, but unfortunately was taken down by a, by a infected bed, bed sore, basically. So, um, That's incredible. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, you get back my pleasure, John.